And greetings, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Welcome to the Evidence and Reasons for the Christian Faith video channel. I'm Salvador Cordova. This channel is uh, was organized or it sort of evolved into being a ministry platform for Christian uh, students, particularly science, science, science students at the high school, but particularly the college uh, level, graduate student level and beyond. We've, uh, we're, <laughs> I'm finding uh, many, many of the viewers, uh, the very steady viewers are graduate students, some of them at the PhD level. And it's been very comforting to meet um, uh, people that are like-minded. Hence, some of the, some of the way this channel is conducted tends to be extremely nerdy. We, we talk, we get down into the details. Uh, we talk a lot about creation science just for the record in case people are wondering what my faith background is uh, i'm a professing christian in the evangelical and reformed faith and i'd say mostly reformed i wouldn't <clears throat> call myself a five point or four point calvinist or whatever uh, i try not to i try to resist labels i call myself a bibleist that means if it says a word in the bible I'll use that term to describe. I'll say I believe it. So, so just so you know, uh, for those uh, who are curious what my theological positions are on things. So greetings. Uh, we had uh, the nerd show on flip-ons. We've already had two. And so I'm going to skip a lot of the introductory material. I refer uh, viewers to the earlier shows on flip-ons. We're just gonna do uh, continue doing a reading and going into the technical details of, of the article by Alan Herbert on flip-ons, which he published in the Royal Society. So this is part two and we're I only, it took me two and a half hours to get through 25% of the paper last time. So this is gonna be slow going. The reason I'm devoting this much time to it, I think it's very important for the junk DNA argument. This is going to be, uh, um, as the junk DNA argument uh, falters for evolutionary theory, that's a plus on the creationist side. It also, on, on many levels, one of them, it just shows how vacuous the <clears throat> entire industry is. The, um, that was one of their major predictions one camp of them it's funny there are two camps on the junk dna issue one camp camp says well oh dawkins is in this camp by the way he says well since it's conserved it must do something natural selection would select it on the other hand there uh there are a segment of evolutionary biologists particularly the population geneticists they'll say it has to be junk otherwise we'd be dead and that's a whole nother uh topic on on uh, how, how they deduce that. The math bears out that side. If the DNA, and Dan Grauer echoed it very well, he said, if, if ENCODE, that is the uh, project that said most of the DNA is functional, if ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. And that's what's at stake today. And uh, greetings, Patrick Alexander. Uh, <laughs> You're in for a nerd torture session today. And, and that's the title of the talk today. Sorry we started an hour, over an hour late, but uh, Dr. Bobby Gilstrap was, uh, uh, we had a wonderful interview uh, about church life. So for a lot of the graduate students and students of science out there, uh, we do cover some things on church life because that this, you know, <laughs> um, for the grad students that are Christians, this is part of your life. And, and, and thankfully, that's kind of our reach to the other Christians who are, are not in the same life situation as graduate students or professional researchers and scientists. That's the one thread that holds us together is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, um, whom I dedicate this stream to, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
the subject adjunct DNA, as we find that it's functional, it strengthens the genetic entropy hypothesis, which strengthens the case that humanity is young, which supports a literal reading of the book of Luke, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Hence, the scientific study here is evidence for the Christian faith. That's kind of a long way to get there. But that's why this is important. That's why I'm spending time on it. And it's also a little bit of payback to the evolutionary promoters like Larry Moran, who's been um, getting in the face of ID proponents and creationists saying it's all junk. And they've been doing this for 45 years and haven't discovered anything or much of anything of substance. That has started actually to change uh, even in 2010. So Larry wasn't quite up to the literature or he wasn't buying it as being sufficient in his mind. But now here, tw 12 years later, 2022, stuff is just, the floodgates are starting to open. And I think I'm probably the only ID proponent and only cre creationist to break this story because even the secular world is ignoring this, except for the editors of these important journals. So the readership may not have paid much attention, but the editors thankfully have. Editors of Cell, which is a great journal, and then the Royal Society, uh, the papers of the Royal Society, the, their journal, uh, Royal Society Publishing. So this is uh, the people that are important know this is a big deal. and. Um, I don't. I don't see. I don't see this um, train stopping anytime soon. Um, there've been enough breakthroughs here that I feel confident in saying we're going to continue to find more function because you could just generalize uh, in the experiments that I'll be talking about. Uh, it's easy to see that this could be generalized to the entire human genome and primate genomes as well. So. <clears throat> Apologies uh, in advance. This is going to just be brutal. That's why I call it a nerd torture session. So one of the first things that um, many times I'll see terms there that I'm not too familiar with, or I, I've heard them before, but I'm just like not a, um, you know, not not 100% um, comfortable. Um, uh, describing what it is. And so uh, one of them talked about chip seek. So I'm just going to look up what chip, chip seek is, and I'm just going to read it because that seems kind of important. Um, who was it? Uh, the ENCODE project used a lot of this. So the ENCODE project was a $500 million effort. The follow-ons approaching now probably uh, – you add them all together, it's probably a billion dollars invested in this. A lot of the money went into um, running ChIP-seq experiments. So let's look at what ChIP-seq is, because it's in this Royal Society paper that I'm reading right now. So why don't I show the Royal Society paper while we're at it? <clears throat> and... Let me let me let me bring this. Let me let me try to bring it up here. You'll indulge me. So this is the Royal Society paper here that we're doing a reading from. And as I said, we already covered it, uh, parts of it in the last talk. This paper, ALU non-B DNA confirmation slip-ons, binary codes, and evolution. We won't go two hours tonight. I, I could feel the gas tank uh, getting toward the empty mark, and I'll have to turn in soon. But I, I did want to at least follow through and, and, and do a little something on this because I, I don't want to keep, I don't want to allow, I don't want to allow the momentum to, to quit because this is, this is great. Um, this is a great paper. 
it's a great topic and it just feels good uh, to give a little payback to people like Larry Moran and Dan Grauer and Ryan Gregory, Francisco Ayala, John Advice, who were just saying the genome's full of junk and they've been saying this for decades and um, I'm just gloating to just see how wrong they are. Um, and so this is glorious. So in that paper I just uh, showed on the screen briefly, it, it mentions ChIP-seq as some of the experiments that provide evidence for the functionality functionality of DNA uh, of the of one section of, of various sections of non-coding DNA, particularly the ALU elements. So let's just find out what the chip seek technology is all about. So I'll bring it up here, and I have a Wikipedia entry on it. And chip sequencing. C H I and notice it's capitalized the I and the P, so that means it's an acronym. So chip sequencing is also known as chip seek, is a method to analyze protein interactions with DNA. Chip seek combines chromatin immunoprecipitation chip with massively parallel DNA sequencing to identify binding sites of DNA associated proteins. It can be used to map global binding sites precisely for any protein of interest. Previously, chip on chip was the most common technique utilized to study these protein DNA relations. Okay, okay, now I know a little more what this is about. So uh, let me just minimize this. And I'm going to look up something else. So that's ChIP-seq. Uh, Encode. Hang on. So let me show the ENCODE logo. This this should be very, I, I hope I could, okay, I hope I get a good image on this so it's not too blurry. So you just heard the word chip seek, and let's see if it has here. Uh, the ENCODE project, as I said, it's already approaching a billion dollars now in, in terms of total funding uh, for the ENCODE, the ENCODE being about 500 million. But we can tack on to that about um, another half billion for all the follow-on projects. But you could see right here, uh, let's see, yeah, right here. You could see right, oops, right here, right here in this area, it says ChIP-seq. That's one of the experiments. So they have, um, they had all these experiments to determine that uh, the characteristics of the uh, of the non-coding DNA, and it was actually to characterize both the coding and non-coding regions. Uh, and really, we could say that ENCODE was really researching. Uh, it ended up that it researched what we call the epigenome, the epigenome, which are what they would call really chromatin modifications. So this line here depicted is the DNA, and you have the genes in green. Then you have the non-coding regions, and then they have this thing. What ChIP-seq will do is to see what kind of proteins connect. They use the word bind. So when they say uh, ChIP-seq identifies DNA binding regions, it's really basically where uh, the proteins, uh, which sec segments of DNA and where would the uh, a protein connect to and bind and, and operate on the DNA. So the, I'm just going to read out some of the, since while we're on here, let's see the other names of the projects. There's the 5C Chia Pet. That's a cute name, Chia Pet. Uh, that leads to help us, help us understand how the chromatin, the DNA chromatin, um, can be organized in three dimensions spatially and then also over time. So 
Uh, we call that the 4D nucleome project, how DNA chromatin is uh, configured over four dimensions. There's this DNA seq and fair fair seq um, that talks about where the DNA can get cut. And then we just talked about chip seq. We have the uh, WGBS and RBS methyl 450K. Yeah, those are um, experiments that determine where the methylation marks are on the DNA. These are like chemical decorations, like Christmas tree ornaments. Uh, computational predictions in RT-PCR, I'm not familiar with that. RNA-seq, I think, is kind of like a chip-seq. I don't know that for sure. And they have clip-seq and RIP-seq. And I don't know what those are. So strike what I said about RNA-seq. I have no clue what that is. So their ENCODE had done a ton of experiments to uh, identify functionality in, uh, of, of DNA. Unfortunately, I have to, um, have to kill a bot here. I had to shoot down, gun down a bot here. <laughs> OK, so let's continue. So now, now I know what ChipSeq. ChipSeq determines, why don't I bring the Wikipedia article back up just to cover it to make sure I know that I got the story right again, that I'm remembering it correctly. Chip sequencing, also known as ChipSeq, is a method used to analyze protein interactions with DNA. ChipSeq combines chromatin immunoprecipitation with massively parallel DNA sequencing to identify the binding sites of DNA associated proteins. It can be used to map global binding sites precisely for any protein of interest. So you could take a protein and you could figure out where it connects, uh, if and where it connects the DNA. Um, previously, chip on chip was the most common technique utilized to study these protein DNA relations. By the way, chromatin immunoprecipitation, I think. Uh, I won't go there. It is another technology. See, in, the, in this world of hyperlinking, you can just keep going down as many levels and rabbit trails as you want. And I'm not going to get through the paper if I keep doing that. So let's go back to the Royal Society paper since we're there. So where did we leave off? We left off at this paragraph, and let me see if I can kind of widen my screen here so I can see it a little clearer. <clears throat> Apologies that it's a little blurry, but anyway, we're just, I'm just going to, uh, we might just have to bear with it. Let me just make sure it looks at least halfway decent um, on YouTube. Hopefully it'll look a little better on YouTube than it does in my StreamYard screen. Eh, it's not great. It's a little blurry. I don't know why. I don't know why I can't render static text to, to look a little better. Let me see if I can make this just a tad bigger. Okay, that barely fits. It looks a little better. Okay, so this is where we left off, and I'm just going to uh, keep reading from where we left off last time. The existence of proteins that bind ZDNA with high affinity provide evidence for, for the biological relevance of this conformation. The best known example involves the P150 isoform. Uh-oh. Another rabbit trail. I want to find out what an isoform, I'm, I'm pretty sure it deals with alternative splicing. But let me just verify. Okay, 
Let's look at the Wikipedia article. Here it is. Protein isoform. A protein isoform or protein variant is a member of a set of highly similar proteins that originate from a single gene or gene family and are the result of genetic differences. While many perform the same or similar biological roles, some isoforms have unique functions. A set of isoforms may be formed from alternative splicing. Yep, okay, that's it. Uh, variable promoter usage or the post-transcriptional modifications of a single gene. Post-translational modifications are generally not considered. Oh my goodness. This is a little thick here. There's a difference between post-transcriptional modification and post-translational modification. We don't quite have the time to get into that. And, and look who's here. Hi, pigs can fly. Nice to see you. Um, I hear there could be a dumpster fire over at another channel. And I, I think, uh, I don't know if you came from that. But if you did, thanks for dropping in. This is a nerd torture session. I'm doing this um, kind of as a service to myself because I really need to read this paper. I talked to Dr. Sanford yesterday morning, and I said I, I, I want to do a report on this. Talked to Dr. Deweese also, and I said I, I think we need to know this. And if I'm going to be advocating this, I better know my stuff better. So this is actually kind of my own I probably would have been doing this anyway, but since I have a YouTube channel, I said, darn, why don't I just dump it out there um, while I'm reading it? I could educate myself and maybe if some poor soul wants to be tortured, he might, he might pick up something up. But it's also my way of showing the internet world, especially the critics of creationism and ID, that this channel is really serious about arguing for function in junk DNA. And I'm also pointing out, um, kind of uh, to alert them, I think we're going to win this argument because what I hear floating around on the internet by creationists is, is not going to be at this level, primarily because no one hardly ever references this work. Oh, my goodness. Um, so... Um, if you want to hop in, uh, Pigs Can Fly, I'll, I'll, I can send you an email with the uh, restream link. Uh, but I don't know that you may want to be tortured after a 14-hour shift. But congratulations on your hard work trying to get um, bread on the table for your lovely family. And God bless you. Thanks for dropping in. And um, Well, this won't be the most entertaining session. But it also does, I'm trying to send also a signal. It's like um, people that want to be critical creationists. Uh, just want to let you know, uh, at least this channel is pretty serious about fighting for this. And this ain't the Kent Hoven channel. This is serious graduate level stuff. <laughs> Pigs and Fly says, I barely have time to watch this, let alone a dumpster fire. Ha, ha, ha. Okay, so, okay, now I know what an isoform is. An alternative splice is an isoform, but, iso but uh, an isoform isn't necessarily, isn't necessarily the result of an alternative splice. It could be from variable promoter usage or post-transcriptional modification. So Pigs Can Fly is saying he's pretty tired. Well, I got to tell you, I, I don't know that I could last another half hour. My last show on this was two and a half hours, but, you know, um, I did want to just keep the momentum going on this paper because we're really going to take it to the evolutionists on this. Since you just arrived, I'll just fill you in. Uh, Dr. Dan and my debate with him was putting one class of DNA as evidence against genetic entropy. Uh, he, he said, um, 
this particularly this class of DNA known as the lose, which accounts for 11% of our genome, you put it on the table as junk. If the alludes are not shown to be junk, that alone would be sufficient to prove Dr. Sanford's genetic entropy hypothesis. And uh, so that's why it's important. But there are a lot of principles with the allu elements and how they function that probably could be extensible to the operation of uh, a lot of other kinds of non-coding DNA, like ERVs, um, uh, line uh, line DNAs, and uh, link link RNA DNAs, um, how introns work, because lots of elements are in introns. So um, that's, that's basically why. And if we prove the genetic entropy hypothesis, this supports a recent human, um, humanity came on the planet relatively recently. So that's also evidence against human evolution. But the most important thing is it would support a literal reading of the genealogy of Christ in Luke chapter 3, which would lend credibility to the Christian scriptures, which would lend, which would suggest that um, the Christian scriptures are handed indeed from our Creator and from God Himself. And uh, hence the Christian faith is the one true faith. And all the other faiths are the work of the devil. To quote John MacArthur in a sermon I heard recently. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's just keep moving. I'm tired too, brother. It's been a long day for me, please comply. So God bless you for working so hard. 14-hour shift. You inspire me, brother. I need some inspiration to work really hard too because uh, um, that would do me a lot of good if I worked as hard as you. I think it would do a lot of people good. So let's just keep uh, plugging along here. And I'm going to go back to my other computer in this Royal Society page. So I got hung up on the word isoform. All right, so let's just start reading again. <laughs> the existence of proteins that bind ZDNA with high affinity provide evidence for the biological relevance of this conformation. The best known example involves the P150 isoform of the ADAR, that is the adenosine deaminase RNA specific enzyme. Actually, the acronym is aden adenosine deaminase acting on RNA. <laughs> Um, with its Z alpha domain that binds Z DNA in structure specific but sequence independent manner. So a domain is a part of a protein that kind of has its own fold. It's kind of a, it, it's a way to kind of decompose the parts of a protein. So it's, it's uh, uh, so we have this protein called ADAR and it has a, uh, a component inside of it called the Z alpha domain. Okay, so it, uh, I'll just continue. Okay, so the best known example involves the P150 isoform of, of ADAR, adenosine deaminase RNA specific enzyme, with its Z alpha domain that binds Z DNA in a, in a structure specific but sequence independent manner. That's really amazing, by the way. Um, no time to get into exactly why that's amazing, but it's, it is amazing. Even to sequences like DAT that do not form DNA Z easily in, in vitro, mutations to the amino acid residues contacting ZNA like uh, N173S, and I believe that means a mutation in the 173rd position of the P150, uh, where it takes an, an N, which is asparagine, I think, and converts it to an S, which is serine. And P193, which is converting uh, the proline in position 193 
to an alanine are causal for type 1 interferonopathies, characteristic of Mendelian diseases. And Dr. Dan uh, about a week ago said he thinks Mendelian diseases refer to recessive uh, diseases, um, such as uh, Icardi Gutierrez syndrome, revealing an important regulatory role for the Z duplex in innate immunity. I don't know why it's called a Z duplex. And I'm going to go on. The P193, uh, the proline 193 to alanine mutation is associated with reduced double strand RNA, DS RNA editing, and increased induction of the interferon response factor IF3 gene. Okay, let me just Google briefly what a Z duplex is. And I'm really tired. If I'm slurring my words, it's because I'm just I'm just out of gas, but I'm I'm committed to finishing uh, another half hour. And then I'll call it quits. Because that last interview also took some gas and I've been up a real long time. I'm going up on 16, <laughs> 17 hours straight now. And I'm tired. But uh, let's. Okay, I don't get Z duplex. Z duplex DNA. Oh boy. I'm having a hard time getting just a simple answer to what a Z duplex is. Okay, I'm just gonna have to skip it and maybe someday I'll find out what it is, okay? Um, oh, well, we have this Wikipedia article. Let me just put up the Wikipedia article. In molecular biology, the term Double helix refers to the structure formed by double-stranded molecules of nucleic acid, such as DNA. The double helix structure of nucleic acid complexes arise as a consequence of secondary structure. Okay, so let's see if we have, can find the word duplex here. Duplex. Okay, non-double helical forms. Alternative non-helical models were briefly considered in the late 1970s as a potential solution to the problems in DNA replication in plasmids and chromatin. However, the models were set aside in favor of double helical model um, due to subsequent experimental advances such as X-ray crystallography of DNA duplexes, duplexes and later the nucleosome core particle. And the discovery of topoisomerases, one of my favorite enzymes and I published on that, and also double non-double helical models are not currently accepted by the mainstream community. I still don't know what a DNA duplex is. is so I'm just uh, too hard to figure out and I'm too tired to look it up. I might have to ask a biochemist what that is. Um, I get letters from Joe DeWeese every every day, almost every day now because our team's working on a paper, but he's too busy right now for me to just call him up and say, hey Joe, what's, what's a DNA duplex? So, all right. So let's continue. Studies have uh, studies have revealed that ADAR Z alpha binds a number of genomic sites. ChIP-seq, and there we go, that word again, ChIP-seq, based on an ADAR Z alpha dimer. Well, 
what's an ADAR Z alpha dimer? I, I didn't know ADARs were dimers. Okay, now I'm going to have to look another term up. ADAR. Like radar without the R. Let's see, ADAR. The ADAR enzyme. Let's see if we have a Wikipedia entry. We do. Here it is. It doesn't look like a dimer to me. See the structure. It has been found in mammals that the conversion of A to I, that is adenine to inosine, requires homodimerization of ADAR1 and ADAR2, but not ADAR3. Whoa! Oh man, this is so complicated. So there are times when um, you get the pair that will join, like a pair of scissors. Uh, there are times um, I don't know if that's the best analogy, but you know you could take one. You know you have a pair of scissors because really you have kind of that scissor. You know one part that has to be joined to another half. And you can make a pair, but uh, a single scissor could actually even just be like a knife. So these ADAR enzymes, apparently, that can act by themselves or then join with a partner uh, to be able to do these things like homodimer, uh, like uh, A to I editing. Let me just finish reading the, the wiki article. In vivo studies have not yet been conclusive. If RNA binding is required for dimerization, a study with ADAR1 and two mutants, which were not able to bind to dsRNA, were still able to dimerize, showing they may bind based on protein protein interactions. Okay, so that was starting to get in a rabbit trail, but now at least I can I can go to my my rest knowing uh, about the dimerization of ADAR enzymes. Okay, studies have revealed that a, uh, ADAR Z alpha binds to a number of genomic sites. ChIP-seq, based on an ADAR Z, Z alpha dimer, identified a total of 391 Z-forming sequences. mostly 46% uh, in promoters and associated with act active histone marks such as H3K4ME3. And let me just decode that. That means histone 3 in the nucleosome. Uh, K4 is the fourth lysine. And ME3 stands for uh, the methylation level at 3. Oh, there you go. Pigs can fly. Pigs can fly. Said my wife learned about a D-dimer from her phlebotomy class. Whoa, she's she can do. She's a phlebotomist. Awesome. Okay, uh, histone marks, active histone marks such as H3K4ME3 and H3K9AC. So that's histone three, lysine number nine. Um, lysine in position 9, and it's an acetylation mark. That's AC. Okay, so there, there are three... Uh, okay, so... Even though there are a million alus, the ADAR with uh, Z alpha dimer was identified only on a total of 391 Z forming sequences. Um, I have to point out the reason I need to point that out is 
the evolutionary biologists say, well, that's such a tiny number. And I want to say, well, wait a time out. That's only in the cells that we've done experiments on. There are 100 trillion cells in a human body. Uh, I wouldn't rule out that um, uh, ADAR could target practically all the alus if we had all the cells. So it's premature to say this is only a small fraction. So we have this is too small a sample size to make that ruling that um, that there are only 391 uh, locations because we don't have all the cell types and all the developmental stages. Okay, we don't have all the cells. You just don't know. Just pointing that out. So let's go on. The MAP genes are enriched for replication-dependent histones prone to citrullination. Okay, so let's look at citrullination. It's citrullination. Let's pull out the handy-dandy Wikipedia entry on citrullination. Citrullination of uh, or de deimmunation is the conversion of. Hang on, I have a little technical problem here. Is the conversion of the amino acid arginine in a protein into the amino acid citrulline? I learned something here. Citrulline is not one of the 20 standard amino acids encoded by DNA in the genetic code. Instead, it is the result of a post-translational modification. Whoa. Citrullination is distinct from the formation of the free amino acid citrulline as part of the ure urea cycle or as the byproduct of enzyme of the nitric oxide synthase family. Citrullination. Okay. okay, so now I learned, I relearned, I guess, uh, another kind of amino acid, citrulline. Citrullination. Citrullination. Okay, so going back here, it said that the MAP genes are enriched See if we, yeah, the map genes. I'm up here. I don't know if you could see my pointer there. The map genes are enriched for replication dependent histones prone to citrullination. Replication dependent histones. Okay, so I didn't know that histones could be prone to citrullination. Cell cycle factors. Transcription factors and topoisomerase 3 alpha. Okay, let me. This is thick. The MAP genes are enriched for replication dependent histones prone to citralization, cell cycle factors, transcription factors. Topi isomerase 3A, which is essential for resolution of D loop recombination intermediates. So I think it's targeting um, specifically topi, topi isomerase 3 alpha. I'm not at all familiar with 3 alpha. I work on 2 alpha. The centromeric repeats found in an earlier study are most likely in. Uh, most likely encode blacklist sequences as they lack a strong Z-forming motif. A recent study of the ADAR-Z alpha regulation of fear extinction in mice found that 80%, 97 or over 22, of RNA editing sites overlap with ADAR-1 DNA binding with an overrepresentation of the sign line elements nearby. 
Okay. Um, Pigs, can, Pigs can fly. Are you familiar with chromatin and histones at all and nucleosomes? Um, that'll help me possibly answer your question. So let me just show a nucleosome. Okay, Wikipedia is here, nucleosome. If I can get a nice picture here. So I'm going to show you a picture, and I'll, that would be a good explanation. This would be a good time to the rest of the viewers just to show them. Just give me a moment here. I'm going to try to make this bigger so you all can see it. So we know about DNA. The DNA is organized in chromosomes. When you start to uncoil the DNA, I mean, pull it out of the chromosome, you get this thing called chromatin. And chromatin is DNA that's wrapped around histones. So when you wrap DNA around a histone, it makes what they call a nucleosome. So histones, you could see how closely, um, you know, it's just like a spool. this so it's like a uh, if you have a spool that you wrap a thread thread around uh, that's kind of like what a histone does but it's a lot way more sophisticated so I mean a really 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 crude way of talking about what a histone is it's like a spool but it, it's able to uh, acquire different uh, chemical states. So it's like a piece, it's actually like uh, um, random access memory. In fact, one book on stem cells actually used the term random access memory to describe histones. So let's keep moving on. And well, okay, so why don't I describe then what the histone, since we're talking about histones, and I just tried to do all the decoding. Uh, let me see if I could find it. And this, this is worth it, even just to talk about the complexity of what we're dealing with here. Oh, I'm really glad You're asking these questions. This this makes it worthwhile, and it also sometimes um, there's a saying: one way to learn a subject is to teach it. And so, um, this is good review for me personally. A histone, a histone is a protein. So, so histones are a name of a protein, and if you see this spool here. That's a histone right there. And, and you see the blue there? That's DNA winding around it. So the histone is like a spool, but it's way more because the spool actually has a tail. This is the tail of the histone here. And you can see all these little Christmas tree ornaments hanging off there. Um, since pigs can fly, you're in the Navy. You remember the era of the ships, they, they would, ships would signal each other by hoisting up different little flags on the masts. And the histone is just like, uh, the histone tail is kind of like flags on, on the mast. So let me see if I could find a picture like that because this is in tribute to my Navy friend here.
I don't have a really good example, unfortunately. Uh, Because some of them now are just decorative, but there was a time that ships, um, especially before the radio era, would have to communicate to each other using masts, using the flags on the mast. Uh, let me see if I could. I'm just trying to find one because it would really help explain the histone well. Unfortunately, I mean, I think even like in the battle of, um, in the time of the N Napoleon, uh, there's a famous battle of Trafalgar and these ships were communicating b before the radio era, they would communicate by putting flags on the, on uh, hanging from the ropes on the mast. So it would look something like, you could see all the flags. Now those look like flags of countries, so I don't really think they have the signaling role. So I, I, if, if I could find a picture of that, that would be great. So there's this Bravo Zulu flag, Bravo Zulu flag. So since pig can, pigs can fly mentioned it, oh, here. OK, so I guess that means, let's see here, it says Bravo Zulu. If you have a flag like this hanging from uh, the ropes on the mast, it says, well done, Bravo Zulu. Bravo Zulu. Okay, so let me now show the histones if I can. Hopefully I haven't lost the histone pictures. Going back to the histones, there you go. So you have these flags here and, and you can see you can have all sorts of flags put on that position. And so the histone is made of amino acids, and each amino acid has a has a number, just one to whatever. And so, like um, in the paper here, so let's go back to the paper. You can see in the paper it says, and I'll try to highlight it. See if I can highlight it. H3K4ME3. So let's see if we could find it here. Um, it's kind of hard to see it. There are actually uh, four pairs of histones numbered one through four, I think. And on the third histone, H3. So histone three, and it says K4. And see, it's right there. It says right there, K. Do you see it? It says here, K4 right there. And the mark is ME3. So there should be a methylation. You can barely see it. It says ME right there. And there are all these protein machines that can dock on that position and, and add that little Christmas decoration that they call ME3. Let me look for another diagram. It might even help better. Just give me a moment. Stone. Okay. Here's a slightly better diagram. Okay, I'll, I'll bring it up. This is actually a good review for me too. Let's 
so the spool is basic is really four is actually eight histones but you can say it's four histone pairs so you have identical copies of h3 uh two you know uh in identical copies of h of h2b h2a h4 now why the, oh so just going back they don't number them one through four and this is because of historical experimental reasons that they just got those names had to do with uh the way that they were identifying it in the laboratory oh and and pigskin flies is pointing out the use of the flags most of it is identification, but it can also be, be for letting people know the status of the ship in the event of something unexpected. And that's great. So we could see here, going back to this diagram, you could see histone three, and this would be one, amino acid one, two, three, four. And there's the K, K stands for lysine, the amino acid lysine, and it can be methylated or acetylated. And so that's histone 3K4. And notice there's a ninth one here. So that's four, five, four, five, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's another K here, and it can get an AC on it or a methyl group, but it can also be an AC acetylation. So going back to the paper, that's what this, this coding is, is about. I know that was thick. That's a crash course. It's really, I gave you a two hour lecture worth in just about two minutes, uh, five minutes. So if it seems rushed and incomplete, it's because it, my presentation was just no time for, to keep, uh, to get into detail. And I have about three more minutes, but I'll try to get through this paragraph. Gee, it's taken me about an hour to get through two paragraphs. Okay, this is tough. Um, so we'll just continue on here. Uh, uh, I'll just start around here, cell cycle factors. Cell cycle factors, transcription factors, and topoisomerase 3A, which is essential for resolution of D-loop re, recombination intermediates. Uh, I don't know what that is. I'm not, the topoisomerase I study is 2A, not 3A. D-loop recombination intermediates. The centromeric repeats found in an earlier study are most likely encode blacklist sequences, which means maybe they shouldn't count, as they lack a strong Z-forming motif. A recent study of the ADAR-Z-alpha regulation of fear extinction in mice found that 80%, 90 divided one by 122, of RNA editing sites overlap ADAR-1 DNA binding. Oh, this is thick. A recent study of the ADAR Z alpha regulation of fear extinction in mice. Okay, I got it. Just I just want to mention something here. It, it's it's talking about fear extinction in mice. That means they could play with its genes; and it'll never fear anything. So uh, it's not going to run away from anything. <laughs> That's amazing that one gene could control that. So let me just try to plow through this, this paragraph and I'm done for the night because totally out of gas at this point. The uh, centromeric repeats found in an earlier study are most likely ENCODE blacklist sequences as they lack a strong Z-forming motif. A recent study of the ADAR-Z alpha regulation of fear extinction in mice found that 80%, that is 97 over 122, of RNA editing, the editing sites overlap with the ADAR1 DNA binding. Oh my, that, that means, let me uncoil this a little bit. That's just like unbelievable. This is dual use. 
So the DNA string has one meaning in the DNA state. The transcript that comes off of that has another meaning in the, you know, with the RNA. And this, um, and it's saying here that this ADAR enzyme in, in, involved in regulation, this ADAR Z alpha, when it's involved in regulation of, of fear extinction in mice, found that 80%, that is 97 over 122, of RNA editing sites. So these are sites on the RNA that can be changed from A to I. ADAR editing sites overlap with the ADAR1 DNA binding sites uh, on the DNA that corresponds to that RNA. That's just nuts with an overrepresentation of sign line elements nearby. Both DNA and RNA editing were absent with loss of function, Z alpha, that is asparagine N175. I'm just trying to decode this. Hang on, I, I'm I'm a little bit uh, okay. Just minor technical problem. So this N175A. So there's a loss of function if in position 175. Um, loss of function. Okay. In the P150 protein, I think, um, both DNA binding and RNA editing were absent when a loss of function, uh, Z alpha, in, in positions um, that's an asparagine in position 175, that's N175A, or to use the phonetic alphabet, November 175 alpha. Um, but N is the asparagine mutating to an alanine in position 175. And Y, Y is tyrosine. So if we, it, it could be the tyrosine in position 179 mutating to an alanine. Okay, so let's just go back. Uh, both DNA binding and RNA editing were absent when a loss of function Z alpha N1 uh, um, asparagine 175 to alanine or tyrosine 179 to alanine. Mutant was tested in the in vivo assay. That means outside in a test tube outside of cell. The response also depends upon prion formation. Holy smokes, prions in here. Depends on prion formation by the cytoplasmic polyadenation element binding protein C CPEB3 depends on the prion formation by the cytoplasmic polyadenation element binding protein CPEB3. Holy smokes, that's a loaded. Oh, man. I told you this is going to be agony. <laughs> I want to find out what that what a prion is. I, I, I always thought it was associated with disease. Is, is that part of normal function? So let's look at prion. I mean, I first heard about prions in mad cow disease because because these these prions spread and the, the cow goes crazy. It's just incredible, just a little reshaping of the protein and the thing goes, causes a whole cow to go crazy. By the way, the, the nickname for Rachel Maddow on MSNBC's Rachel is Rachel Mad Cow. I know, I know that was totally random. So let's look at what, um, if prions could be normal. It says here, prions are misfolded proteins with the ability, ability to trans, their misfold shape onto normal variants of the same protein. 
They characterize several fatal, fatal and transmissible neurodegenerative diseases in humans and many other animals. So it's saying it's abnormal. That's why it's confusing me because it's suggesting, let's look back here, it says here about the prion. Oh, okay, so it says here the response also, this response also depends on prion formation by the cytoplasmic polyadenation element binding protein. And so what response are they talking about? I gotta I, I I gotta really look and think about what this is describing. Okay, so I'm guessing now that um When there's kind of a dangerous situation, <laughs> yeah, like mad cow. Yeah, um, well, not like exactly mad cow, but let's say there, there's uh, a warning flag situation. There are all these events that are happening um, at this at this alu site, this alu location and all these events happen uh, in response to a prion uh, forming on this protein called CPEB3. Which happens to connect to the polyadenation, uh, the cyt cytoplasmic polyadenation element. So polyadenation is also known as poly A tail. It's something that's added to the tail of an RNA to help it um, do a lot of things. Okay, I'm not gonna, immediately we don't need to go there. And I have one last sentence to get through. Whether Z formation affects memory by altering CPEB3 splicing, oh my, it can alter, okay, it could alter the splicing. Or the processing of miRNA, that's microRNA loci that regulates CPEB3 expression is unknown at present. Whether Z formation affects memory by alter, altering CPEB3 splicing or processing of mRNA, miRNA, miRNA, microRNA loci that regulates CPEB3 expression is unknown at present. Oh my goodness, this is so thick. This this is intense, guys. There 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 is there are so many ways that genes are regulated, meaning like is the gene even like turned on to make the protein and then how much and then if there's alternative splicing and there's a way that there's feedback control loops that you may see in electrical engineering yes ben rex i'm thinking of you <laughs> yes i'm thinking of you ben rex uh, there are these uh, the there are these gene regulatory and they use the word circuit gene regulatory circuits that correspond to electrical engineering circuits where um, there's feedback control. So like your thermostat is a feedback control system. So uh, uh, like if it's too cold, it'll turn on the heat. Once it gets warm enough, it, uh, uh, the thermostat will shut the heater off. So, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's doing something to the environment. And then when the environment uh, changes it gives feedback to the to the mechanism like to the thermostat but we can extend that to other things where there's sorts of regulatory control where there's feedback important so we have where feedback is important 
in, in regulation. And there are a lot of feedback control systems in biology, and they're very complex. They're, I looked at some of the diagrams describing how it operates. It's what they call nonlinear feedback control. And our math is not really very good at handling that. We wouldn't know how to build a circuit like that very easily because we like linear control systems. Just pointing that out there just to show how sophisticated this is. So they're suggesting there could be some of this feedback regulation that involves an, yet another class of RNA called microRNAs or miRNAs. Earlier on, earlier on, we were taught uh, the term, there's another kind of RNA that was mentioned, and I've, I'm having a Joe Biden moment, and I can't remember it. So you had the microRNAs that can, can do regulation. Um, and I... I thought I, I read what the other one was. DSRNAs, double-stranded RNAs, can also be involved in regulation too. Uh, but the DNA and the histones can be involved in regulation. But this is just how this regulatory network works. It's just mind-boggling. Uh, as I said, even though we humans can send men to the moon and build space probes and build jet planes, Engineering at the nanomolecular level is just a whole order of magnitude, if not several orders of magnitude, more difficult because operating in the small dimension is really hard. In this small arena is really hard. Um, our scientists could not build this anything of this sophistication from scratch, not even close. Even if I even if we could somehow give the scientists the blueprint of how all the parts connect together, they wouldn't know how to assemble it. This is how sophisticated this is. They would not assemble it from scratch. So what we do is we just take pre-existing cells because uh, we can't build them from scratch. Otherwise, we probably would have healed all diseases by now. So let, let me just go back and reread this part. Whether Z formation affects memory by alternate altering CPEB3 splicing or the processing of microRNA, miRNA loci that regulate CPEB3 expression is unknown at present. So there are two mechanisms that we can uh, affect the behavior of this protein called CPEB3. CPEB3. One is through alternate splicing or the other is microRNA, or both, which would be totally cool if it's able to regulate with, in both pathways. Yeah, the complexity, <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, the difficulties that he used to say, all right, the problem is assembly. You want RNAs? I'll give you that. I'll give you the DNAs. I'll give you the proteins. I'll give you the cell membranes. I'll give you that. Can you put that together? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for remembering. Uh, pigs can fly. So let's see. Let's wrap it up. Uh, so Z formation can affect the memory. Uh, uh, can affect the alternate splicing of C, this protein called CPEB3. Um, it could, or it could affect the loci that are targets for the microRNAs, or it affects both. And they're saying uh, it's, it, it's unknown at present how this uh, Z formation, the, the mechanism of affecting the regulation but before we close, I want to find out what this protein is, CPEB3. And they have, do they have a gene card? Did someone make a Wikipedia entry? See, you can tell that um, 
it's probably a protein researcher on that protein that's writing the Wikipedia entry because you don't have a protein biologist that studies like all proteins. Usually it'll be just like one of the 20,000 proteins, like say, for example, in the human, someone could spend their life, professional life on just one protein because they're so complicated to figure out. And there's, um, so first of all, they're complicated to, 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 um, to even make something that sophisticated. And we haven't figured out how a lot of these things actually do their job. So anyway, let's look at the CPEB protein. CPEB or cytopla cytoplasmic polyadenation element binding protein is a highly conserved RNA binding protein that promotes the elongation of the polyadenine tail of messenger RNA. All right, so let's see if I can get a picture of the polyadenine tail. So when the gene is transcribed, you have the coding sequence, which is, which is used as a, as a um, blueprint for the protein. And then you have all these other parts, like the untrans what they call the untranslated region. There's this cap and then these five prime untranslated region. And at the very end is this poly A tail, polyad polyadenine tail. And that's where the CPEB3 protein works. Did I get the name right? CPEB3 protein. Okay. So all this said, thank you for joining me. And pigs can fly. It means a lot that you join because I think you're the only one who's willing to get tortured. I only have one viewer on this video. And that's, as I said, that's all right, because I wanted to read this paper for, for also for my own benefit, as, it, uh, it, as it's very important to the genetic entropy hypothesis and also kind of um, rubbing it in to the evolutionary biologist who insists that most of the genome is junk. And there's a certain channel whose name will not be mentioned the owner of the channel um, kept saying, we're finding out more and more of the genomes junk every day. And just like, I don't know what you've been smoking. <laughs> I shouldn't say that because uh, you know, the guy had some issues in his past about drugs. So <laughs> I know that was mean, but he's not exactly on my Christmas card list. Um, I mean, I don't have a lot of ill will toward him. I just rather forget him. Um, he posts some really negative things about me and my work and doesn't represent it accurately. Usually a straw man and he'll have a panel of people just make stuff up and they're clueless. So sorry, sorry to end on a, I shouldn't end on a nasty note. Anyway, let's try to end on a happy note in honor, in honor Jesus Christ, who is honored by creation. It says in Romans 1.20, uh, his, that is God's, eternal power and divine nature are clearly revealed, clearly seen in the things that are made. And so what we had studied, the complexity, we need to, even if the viewers here haven't understood most, maybe 99% of what was said, Hopefully it will convey just the sheer complexity uh, and intricacy and genius that are in um, that are in DNA that the evolutionary biologists for like some 45 years have been saying is junk. In fact, the very thing that they have called out to be junk is probably one of the most elegant systems. Um, in, in, in DNA, that's the ALU elements. They've insisted it's junk and it's not looking like it. In fact, it's very, very, very sophisticated. I hope that in the three and a half hours so far that I've been reading through this paper, you can, and I'm not even finished. I'm not even, I'm barely over 25% through, barely, 
uh, and not even 30%, 33%, a third through. And it's already taken three and a half hours just to read this paper and even halfway understand what it's saying. This is telling us just how sophisticated this machinery is. And it's beautiful and it's elegant. And um, it's actually, you know, as technical as it has been, it's been very satisfying reading it because it declares the glory of God. And it also uh, puts to shame those who've called his work junk. So uh, it's like, um, like that, uh, like that point in the game between Georgia and Alabama uh, toward in the fourth quarter, where the defensive back seals the game for Georgia. He intercepts. That's one thing, and then he runs it into the end zone. So this is like taking an interception, you know, taking it away from the evolutionary biologists, intercepting their pass, which was saying that this is junk, and then to top it off, to run it into the end zone, because it's not only is it not junk, it is highly sophisticated design that exceeds all the technologies collectively of humankind, of mankind. And that would suggest that this is made by an almighty creator. So praise God for his works. And so this channel isn't just about debate. It's about honoring. It's not just about debate or apologetics. It is doing what uh, is said in Psalm 77, declaring the works of God. And this reading tonight has done that. Take care. And God bless all my Christian brothers and sisters. Amen.